Tress has to navigate her way through pirates, negotiate with a dragon, trick a sorceress, it gets fun. We talk a lot about writing and stories and how poor they are in movies and television lately. So I wanna talk about excellent writing with a book and author you need to read, Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. First, I'll discuss the book, then I'm gonna gush a little bit about the author, and then there's an awkward part at the end. Wish you weren't so awkward, bud. In honor of Tress, I've got my fancy cup here with some tea. There she is, that's what she looks like, apparently with the uh, bookmark swag that I got from a Kickstarter project. And just like Tress, you may have noticed that I like to collect uh, fun cups. Actually, I should probably, let's like, can we display it? Bam. So if you've never read Sanderson, this is a great book to start because it's very easy. You would probably classify this as a YA novel. It's not terribly complex or epic like a lot of his series are, but it is beautiful. My wife likes to call it precious. I mean, it's playful, it's fun, it's just, Bloody delicious. Now, the story in this book is somewhat simple, but that actually works to its benefit because the star of the show really are the characters and their interactions and the growth of the titular Tress. The other star is the beautiful language, is the story is told by a narrator named Hoyd, who is a traveling storytelling character that features in many of the author's books. This story is told as a story, like a campfire tale or a street performance. First thing, spoiler-free plot. Tress lives on a boring backwater island and the king has decreed nobody leaves the island except nobles. She's poor and she washes windows, including at the Duke's Manor, where she gets to talk to the love of her life, Charlie, who is also the Duke's son. Charlie disappears on a diplomatic trip, but nobody seems to care because he's kind of annoying to everybody, except Tress, who is infatuated with his unroyal plainness, so she resolves to rescue him. Without him, the world around me changes. Her trip turns into quite the adventure that takes place on the high seas, which are different from our seas because this is a fantasy novel. The oceans are made of a dust substance called spores that, when touching water, erupt into a specific thing based on their color. The green bursts into vines, the red into spikes, things like that. Tress has to navigate her way through pirates, negotiate with a dragon, trick a sorceress, it gets fun. Sanderson said he was heavily inspired by The Princess Bride, and it shows. True love is the greatest thing in the world. This book is fantastic. My only complaint is that two characters each have their own joke they keep telling, and it they keep telling it, and they keep telling it. Now, one of the things that keeps this from being just another YA adventure with a strong heroine is that Tress is decidedly weak. She's grown up on this sheltered island. She has no skills or experience that are going to make her an action hero. She also isn't filled with wanderlust, always seeking adventure out into the world. In fact, the only reason she wants to leave the island is to rescue Charlie, bring him back, and continue the simple life that she loves. This is such a refreshing detour from the modern heroine tale. Now, don't get me wrong, she definitely is the hero of this story, but Sanderson amazingly avoids the strong female character asshole trope that we've come to expect at this point because of visual media. She defeats most situations through the power of determination, critical thinking, and as cheesy as it sounds, the power of friendship. She is a genuine, caring person that naturally attracts people that want to care for her in return. Throughout the story, the bonds she forms with the people around her and the way they want to reciprocate is just wholesome. At one point, the narrator stops to tell us that her taking a break to think deeply and gather more information is what impresses him as a storyteller because it's so rare among heroic tales. She is not strong because she magically gains the power to punch her enemies into dust. She's strong because she considers problems fully and builds a strong team. Even when she tries to do the fucking annoying, I have to do this alone so no one gets hurt bullshit, her team cares enough to just ignore that garbage. She's just a lovable, wholesome character in a book that is full of lovable, wholesome characters. The backbone of this story, however, is the storyteller. Hoyd is a seemingly immortal character that features in other books by Sanderson. He's very witty and loves to tell stories and playfully confuse people with flowery statements that enigmatically wrap up his true meaning. Sometimes these statements are deep and philosophical, and other times they are complex sounding nonsense. The real fun is that sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Hoyd tells the story and he's in the story, so he gets to make 
make fun little interjections and notes as we go. The author said he wrote this book to find Hoyd's voice for a future book where he's going to detail his backstory. You can tell he's having an absolute fucking blast writing as this character. He's making up outlandish metaphors, excellently worded descriptions, and goofy analogies. I won't drag this out, but I have a couple of excerpts from the beginning of the book to give you an idea. Talking about Tess, he says, in short, Tess was a normal teenage girl. She knew this because other girls often mentioned how they weren't like everyone else. And after a while, Tress figured that the group, everyone else, must include only her. The other girls were obviously right, as they all knew how to be unique. They were so good at it, in fact, they did it together. That needs to be read to every teenager. At one point, they're discussing a plan to get off the island, and her mother says it's a bad idea, and her father remarks, it is, but a terrible idea executed brilliantly has to be better than a brilliant idea executed terribly. I mean... Look at pelicans. I don't know why that shit tickles me. At one point, he's describing the Duke and his mansion, which is on top of a hill, and he says the mansion is squatted like a corpulent frog atop its lily. Tress wasn't certain why the Duke liked it up here. It was closer to the smog, so maybe he liked the similarly tempered company. Climbing all this way was difficult, but judging by how the Duke's family fit their clothing, perhaps they figured they could use the exercise. He could have just said the Duke was a fat asshole, but that's so much better. Back to your place of honor. I suspect one of the reasons he was so playful with the wording is because this book was never actually meant for public consumption. This is the first of four secret books that were released as part of the largest Kickstarter ever. He wrote them during lockdown as a surprise gift to his wife. Four of these during lockdown. First, I gotta compete with Bandit Healer being dad of the fucking year. Now this guy is writing his wife whole books in secret. I'm just glad the Manosphere exists to make me look good by comparison. Since they were meant as kind of a sandbox for him, we really get to see the pure enjoyment he has when writing a one-off side novel like this. Generally, Sanderson is more of an epic series kind of guy, with his excellent Stormlight Archive series going to be 10 books long, maybe. Wheel of Time was supposed to be 10 books, and he turned that into 13. So we'll see. He's loquacious, to put it lightly. This is about a third the size of one of his normal books. If you're a little gun shy about massive epic series, I can also suggest his teenage series, Alcatraz versus the Evil Librarians. This is another playful series where he breaks the fourth wall and generally just has a great time playing around with fantasy tropes. The family in that book has magic powers that are related to like everyday accidents. One character is chronically late, so that means that he can feel his pain later or he can be late and not show up when he's supposed to die. Two things really separate his books from other authors, his magic systems and his come together endings. If you've ever read fantasy, you've probably noticed in the past, magic can get a little out of hand sometimes and ends up just doing whatever the author needs. I've mentioned before, Marvel's Scarlet Witch had this problem. Sanderson is very deliberate about his magic systems and he treats them like a system. They have clearly defined rules and he does a really good job of starting small and then exploring and combining them in creative ways while still saying within those rules. In this book, the main magical thing is this colored sand substance that makes up the ocean. Later on, the characters start to learn uses for them and actually combine them in interesting ways. He actually has an overarching system called Investiture, which takes shape in different ways on each planet in the universe that he's building, which is called Cosmere. The other thing that makes his book satisfying is the ending when everything comes together. I don't want to call these twist endings, because while they are meant to surprise you, they're also telegraphed. You just don't realize it till afterward. This makes his books really fun to read a second time and you start to notice all the hints and there are a lot. He spends the book laying down all these rules and hints and then they all come together for something unexpected and it's just... <sighs> so now things get awkward. Right now you're saying, Greg, thank you so much for bestowing upon me the knowledge of this linguistic Beethoven. Where can I find this book in audio form and hear Michael Kramer's dulcet tones bringing Hoyd's story to life? Normally, this is where I would give you a little pitch for Audible. No, scratch that. I'm still going to do it. If you want to try Audible for free for a month, there's a link in the description. Daddy wants a new studio. However, the beauty of being an affiliate instead of having like an actual contractual ad is that I can tell you why you can find all of Sanderson's library on Audible except this one and the other three that are coming out this year. You can only find those 
on Spotify or Speechify. Mr. Branderson is understandably upset with Audible's terms that they put forward to their authors. He doesn't feel Audible is giving enough of a cut to their authors, and he's taking a stand. He's a big name, and it could have an effect. I had to download Spotify to redeem my Kickstarter code for this, and, uh... I kind of like it better than Amazon Music that I was using. In the meantime, I still do genuinely like Audible. Whatever you decide to go with, I cannot recommend audiobooks enough. Put good shit in your brain. Normally at this point, I would just direct you to more of my content, try to keep you in a loop, or I would make a video explaining the whole Audible situation. Just this once, I'm going to put a link in the description to a different channel, uh, fantasy fan Daniel Green, who has an excellent video explaining the situation between Audible and Sanderson. Thanks for watching. See you next time.